You're listening to the Lifehouse Fellowship Podcast. Wherever you're listening today, we pray that this message is encouraging, it's empowering, and it equips you to change your world. Um, Let's uh, look at the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'm going to be at verse 4. And Miss Bailey, I'm sorry, I I don't know if I gave you all of this. I gave you a portion of it. But we're going to begin in verse 4. It says, listen. Someone say listen. listen. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, we see in the New Testament, Jesus adds, does anybody know? What does Jesus add? Mind, right? All right. Just a side note. Look it up later. Verse 6. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, eight. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. And in modern day terms, sticky note the word of God all over your, all over your life, all over your house, all over your car, whatever you need to do to remember the word and to apply the word to your life, do it. Amen. Think about it. Sleep on it. Talk about it. Live it. Drive it. Whatever you need to do. So today's message goes beyond a traditional Father's Day message. It's intended for everyone. So look to your neighbor and say, this word is for me today as well. It speaks to the essence of this scripture speaks to the essence of the family unit in all its forms. So whether you're part of a single parent home, a blended family, or a traditional household, my goal today is to provide encouragement and challenge each of you, fathers, mothers, grandparents, new parents, experienced parents, parents parents-to-be, to purpose in your hearts to lead by example when it comes to kingdom family. So what do I mean by this? It's a family who aligns itself with the principles and values of the kingdom of God. In essence, a kingdom family strives to reflect the character of God's kingdom on earth, living in a way that brings glory to him and fosters a loving, supportive, and faith-filled environment. As I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about Deuteronomy 6, and I was like, you know, what, is, what was the purpose of what Moses was saying here? Um, and it was, it's been kind of repetitive when you kind of are reading through the Old Testament. There's, it's, it's repetitive to say, make sure you're, you're studying the Word, reading the Torah, applying it, teaching it to your children so that it's passed down from generation to generation, and it can seem repetitive. But how many of you know some things need to be repetitive? It needs to be said over and over and over again until you get it in your thick skull. Some of us have harder heads than others. Amen? (laughs) So Deuteronomy 6, this is uh, the beginning of a prayer called the Shema, which means hear. So religious Jews would pray this prayer twice a day, in the morning and the afternoon, and typically they would cover their eyes as they prayed this so that they would be focused on the prayer. And remembering the Israelites, this is, remembering to them is important because of the covenant Israel has with God. Their nation state has consequences if they fail to keep God's word. It had consequences if they failed to keep God's word and his standard and be obedient to it. Yahweh wants their allegiance in action and in thought. And this is the primary theme of Deuteronomy. God gives them cities they didn't build, houses they didn't fill, cisterns they didn't dig, and vineyards they didn't plant. He is incredibly generous. Amen? How many of you know that? Y'all have seen the generosity of the Lord. <laughs> but he, he always wants them to remember who gave them this. 
How many know that's important? When, when God blesses you, it's important to remember how he blessed you and who that came from or came through. God ultimately, I could, I could give you countless testimonies of how God showed up in our life personally. We had several vehicles given to us. God uh, spoke to individuals who said, yes, we'll be obedient, and they gave us vehicles. And it was for important times in our life that we needed something to drive. And we just remember God's faithfulness each time to say, God, we honor you. We thank you. And I thank you for the individual that was obedient to hear your voice and to meet the need. And so we're always recognizing that those blessings come from the Father. And, um, and then the, the last thing about Deuteronomy 6, he doesn't want them to turn their, their hearts from him to other gods when they receive the blessings. But as we read through the Old Testament, we see that many times they miss the mark on that. And this chapter may seem repetitive of the previous ones because Moses wanted to re-emphasize the instructions to the Israelites. And the reason for this becomes clear throughout the rest of the Old Testament because the Israelites frequently forgot the law when they were doing good. I mean, no, you tend to forget things when when everything's going good and everything's in right order, right standing. You forget who who supplied. You forget who made a way. And you start thinking, you just start getting in yourself and you start getting in your own mindset and think, well, I got this. And you get prideful and arrogant and then then somebody has to break it down for you. Uh Uh-uh, you are where you are today because God allowed you to be where you are today. And God made a way and purposed it that in your life. Hallelujah. I already see that I jumped ahead. Praise God. (laughs) Reverse. (laughs) So Deuteronomy 6, 7 reminds us of the importance of keeping God's command. One of the things that we always say from this platform, and it's been preached... Uh, I've taught on it, preached on it, pastors have taught and preached on it, I've heard multiple other people say from this platform, is, to, is the principle taught in Matthew 6.33 that says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that all, all these things will be added, all these things will line up in its proper place. The reason why we teach it is because it is a foundational truth. You must put God first. Yeah. He has to be put first. So yeah, you're going to hear us say it. Because if you're not putting God first, it's going to be chaos in your, in your life. There's going to be things happening that, that don't need to be happening. You've got to put God, you've got to put Him first. I love what A.W. Tozer says. He says, as God is exalted to the right place in our lives, a thousand problems are solved all at once. Come on. So this truth of putting God first applies to all of us. And as I was praying into this message, I heard this statement, and I, and I know I've heard it somewhere before, but you cannot give what you haven't received. You cannot give what you haven't received. So to lead your family in faith, you must re- first receive and experience God's love, his wisdom, and his guidance yourself. So if you haven't received that, if you haven't received God's love, if you haven't received that into your life, how can you give that to your family? So it all begins with putting God first and saying, God, I want to lead well. I want to lead my family well. And in order to do that, God, I have to draw near to you. I need you desperately in my life. So I want to encourage you, as you read and study the Word of God, um, when, when you see warnings or commands, I want you to take note that those are often, when they're often repeated throughout Scripture, because God is likely reiterating 
them to guide us away from common signs that persist across generations. So when you see something being repeated, a command or a warning, take note. Good. So that you might not fall into that same temptation or fall into that same sin. So my first point, this, well, let me say this. I, I love this because this is important for us to, to, to live by. Believe what you read when it comes to the scripture. Believe what you read. Teach what you believe. And practice what you teach. The last two times, uh, last week as I was ministering, I was asking the Lord, Lord, am I doing this? Am I applying this? Uh, and, and if not, God, what do I need to change? What do I need to shift in my life? As I was preparing for this, I sent a text to all my sons. And I said, where did I lead by example? Where did I lead by example for you? Now, I can say I got a couple texts that were not repeatable. <laughs> But if you want to know the truth, if you're leading your family well, ask your children. Oh, come on. Be, hey, be confident enough and bold enough and don't get all insecure. But ask your children, am I, leading, am, I, am I leading our family well? What do you see me doing that's good, that's honorable, that's noble? And then where are some areas that I might be able to grow in? And I've asked this now. Obviously, you're not going to ask your two-year-old, right? Y'all, but as they get into teen years, uh, and they've had all this time to kind of see mom and dad, and then as they get into teen years, they start making decisions on their own, and you're guiding them through that. It's a great time to just ask them, how am I doing? Where can I grow? So believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. And that's applicable to all of our lives when it comes to the Word of God. All right, number one, leading your family well means building a strong spiritual foundation. Leading your family well means building a strong spiritual foundation. Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua declared, that his household would serve the Lord. And this declaration by Joshua is a powerful statement of commitment that each family member can embrace. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this verse encourages individuals and families to make a conscious decision about their spiritual and moral direction. It underscores the value of commitment to faith and the deliberate choice to uphold kingdom principles in a world where there is many competing influences. Y'all, the moral compass in, in culture today has been broken. It has been stepped on, kicked around, shattered. And it is up to the body of Christ, the church, to say, Something's got to shift. And it begins in the home. And you have to recognize that culture is not in a good place. So in order to shift that, believers, Christ followers, had to step up and hold the standard of righteousness and holiness in a culture that is falling apart. So if you don't understand the difference between right and wrong, and about morality, and about life, and about marriage, and why it's important, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life, holiness, righteousness. If you don't understand it, you better study, you better find out, you better get educated on it yeah. so that you can teach your family. Because this next generation is going, I'm declaring the next generation, the, the young ones that are sitting in here today are gonna be the ones that are change makers in this culture. So 
you got to help them. Now, they can do their studying and do their part, but you have a responsibility to help guide them through. I, lo I love this. It's, there's parenting and there's coaching. And you have a short window to parent your children. After that, it becomes coaching. You're now not telling them what to do or what they need to do. You're coaching them through life. And somewhere as they get into the, you know, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, you, you begin that coaching journey and they begin to understand the consequences of their actions. You provide a safety net, but they have to understand the, the severity of the consequences of their action. Well, you felt that, didn't you? All right, how are we going to get through it? And now we coach them. How do you see yourself overcoming this? How do you see yourself not going back to that? Now, where do you see God in the midst of what's going on? You see, and I begin to coach them through it. I'm not telling them, hey, you screwed up. My gosh, what were you thinking? That was the most horrible decision you could have ever made. You feel the bumps and scrapes on that? Well, you should. <laughs> you, see, you see the difference? <laughs> but I'm going to call them up. It's like, God's got you. We do make mistakes sometimes, but the grace of God carries us through. And the love of the Father. But you know what? You can't be flipping about it. So you need to repent. You need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. And you need to turn away from that that wor the world's way of doing things and turn towards him. Change your mindset. Get your mind out of the gutter. Let's get back on kingdom principles. All right, that doesn't cost you anything. That was all free. So moms, dads, grandparents, uncles, whoever's kind of in that role, but this is, this is just setting the standard in your home. What are the non-negotiables for helping build a solid spiritual foundation in your home? What are the non-negotiables? What are the things that you're not willing to budge on? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In our home, I would, I would say church was not optional. I still yell it at my, some of my kids, right? On the way out, church is not optional, as I busted in the room twice already to try to get them up. <laughs> Thankfully, they're here, praise God. They were a little late, but that's all right. They're here. <laughs> Church is, is not optional. I want you here. I want you to be around other like-minded believers. I want people to encourage you. I want you to see how the body works. It's not perfect. Look around. It's not perfect. <laughs> Try not to look at anybody in particular. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not perfect, but we're doing this thing called life together. Sometimes holding each other accountable, sometimes encouraging one another, sometimes building each other up, worshiping together, we're pursuing after God, believing that he's going to show up in a tangible way today, radically change someone's life. Someone's going to give their life to the Lord today. And we're believing as a body of Christ to say, God, do it in them. You did it for me. Your mercy and grace saved me. So, Lord, I'm asking that you do that for somebody else today. And we're praying and standing in faith together. That's why the body of Christ is so important. We're here to encourage one another, not beat you over the head, not shame you or guilt you. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that needs to do that. We just need to learn to love well. Amen? Love each other to the point where you recognize the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the only one that can change your situation is Jesus Christ alone. Good. That's really good. So what are your non-negotiables? Church commitment, prayer. How about studying the word together at home? Once a month, we're going we're gonna to study the word together. Or twice a month, whatever you decide. What are those non-negotiables for your... For your family, that this is what we're going to do on a regular basis. Engage in family worship. So these practices not only strengthen your faith, but they also create a spiritual atmosphere 
that nurtures your children's relationship with God. This isn't just a one-time event that takes place, but this is creating a culture within your home that nurtures this place of inviting the presence of God into our prayer time, our worship time, whatever it is that we, uh, our non-negotiables are for our family. We want God to show up. I was talking to Peke, there's this church in the Dallas area. They want to, they, part of their mission is to take corporate encounters into personal encounters at home. Did I say that right? Daily, daily personal encounters at home. Y'all, this is great that we come and we encounter God together, and that's so important. What's more important is that you encounter Jesus daily in your life. Every day, you're encountering him. Building a strong spiritual foundation for your family isn't just about faith. It's about shaping the values and principles that will guide your loved ones through life's challenges and triumphs. In a world that is shifting morals and fleeting trends, what lasting legacy are you creating for your family to stand on? Are you going to hold the standard in your home or are you going to allow culture to hold the standard in your home? You're going to do it the way it's going on out here? Well, that's easy. How about put a little challenge in your family to say, we're going to hold the line on purity and holiness and righteousness. We're going to honor God in some areas that we feel are important. So maybe a standard, let me just make this, help make this practical for you. Holding the line uh, for like purity might be, we're not going to do dating until you're out of high school. And so you choose, as a family, <laughs> pick your toes up, this might be a little, but, um, but we, and the reason why is because as you become an adult, every adult in here can look back on past relationships and understand the uh, sometimes trauma, the wounds, the hurts, all the emotions that come with breakups. And it's one breakup after another. You jump from this relationship to this relationship. And you're trying to fill a void that can only be filled by Jesus. Not a boyfriend, not a girlfriend. So I'm not against having friends that are of the opposite sex. What I'm saying is, don't waste your time in high school chasing after boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, trying to seek and be validated or to find your self-worth because it's not going to be found in those individuals. It will only be found in Jesus. So parents, the responsibility for you is to help teach self-worth, identity, and, and model that in your home and value. And so that might be an area where you say, we're not going to date until you get out of high school. Then we'll, we'll let you navigate that and we'll have conversations. But by then, the standard is already set. It's already cemented in, praise God, right? You don't just raise a flag in the West Texas wind and not make sure it's solid. Because <laughs> so, it's going to be tested. So you cement it in. And look, I've, I, had a, I've, I had one that had a relationship. And it went south. And uh, we, we talked through the consequence. We talked through the uh, the, the uh, emotional trauma that comes with that, or maybe not trauma, emotional consequences that come with that. It's real. I'm not saying it's not real. Guys, the, the organization that I work for, we deal with it all the time. Young ladies finding, trying to find their self-worth and value in a guy. 
who's out sleeping with not just them. They have multiple partners. And that's not okay. And so your daughter, your, the one that's important to you is trying to find her self-worth and value in a guy who doesn't value her because he's out sleeping with several other people. I, can I just be real with you this morning? And young men, look, I know it's a great feeling and you feel confident about yourself when you can go tag all these girls and sleep around. But ultimately, you're positioning yourself from the negative consequences of an STD that will sometimes not even, you, you will be passing it and not even know that you have it until years down the road. And you have, had, you have made devastating consequences for others because of your actions. Now from a spiritual level, both male and female, you are giving something to someone else that God meant for one person and one individual. So spiritually, you have spent yourself on multiple people. And so you don't give the best version of you to your future spouse. I always say it like that. I told, the, I told young men, I love Bugatti Veyron when, they, when that first came out. And it's a high-powered machine, but it required a machine. It's a car, <laughs> a very fast car. It is a machine. But it, re, it required a special key to access the part of the car that allowed you to drive it faster. It actually lowered the car, and it brought up a spoiler in the back and allowed you just to get it. <laughs> and I told, I, I told young people as I stood in front of them, I said, listen, your sexuality is like this key. And you wouldn't just give this key to anybody, especially on a million dollar car, multi-million dollar car. You wouldn't just give it to anybody and say, here you go. No, you'd be real picky about it. And it would be for one special person that you would say, here, I give you this key. And they have access to everything in your life. And that should be, according to scripture, should be for your future spouse. I wasn't really going to go here today, but I'm, I'm going there. The other thing is, God designed sex to bring two individuals together as one. And the way that happens from a, from a chemical level is that there are dopamines uh, and chemicals that are released during sexual stimulation that bond two people together. Y'all are just looking at me like he's talking about sex. <laughs> this should be natural in here. <laughs> sex is good for married people. Amen. <laughs> God designed it. But he, those chemicals that are released, vasopressants in men, and um, I just drew a blank, oxytocin for women. And they are actually bonding agents that are released to help solidify the covenant that has been made between a man and a woman. The two shall become one flesh. Now think about this. Every time I sleep with someone else, those chemicals are being released, those bonding agents. And I go and I connect with several. And every time I break up with that individual, I'm literally ripping apart at the fabric my, my being, my, the spiritual being of who I am. And I'm leaving a piece of me with these individuals. Now, can God redeem all that? Yes. yes, he can. I'm not saying this to shame or guilt anybody. I know there's people sleeping around. I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. I wish it were not that way. And, the, and 
part of what I do is I'm seeing the practical side of that. Pregnancies out of wedlock and the STD rates are going are skyrocketing in our area because we're not educating our kids in the home and teaching them that abstinence is the only effective way to keep you from getting pregnant and getting an STD. Now, in the confines of marriage, we hold the standard of the sanctity of marriage when we say, God desires you to be married and to give the best version of you to your future spouse. So why would we waste time giving that to everybody else trying to see, well, is this one it? Is this one going to work? Is this one going to, is this going to work? That's not how it, that's not how it was. Now used to your, your uh, mom and dad would decide for you. They'd sell a few cows off for you. <laughs> Thank God we don't do that anymore. I give you a chicken. And you can have a, a gallon of milk. Praise God. <laughs> Honor yourselves. Honor yourselves and say, I want to give the best version of me to my future spouse. So if you haven't made that decision, young people, choose today to say, I value myself enough to say, I want to give the best version of me. And we teach in the schools, there's, there's actually, and I, physically you can't get back your, your virginity. We would call it secondary virginity, where, where you make a decision moving forward that you're going to honor your, your body. And you're not going to just go out and sleep with anybody and everybody. Okay? So it can happen. God can, God can redeem that. All right, back on track here. Billy Graham said, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. So you have a part to speak into your children's life, your grandchildren's life, and impart a legacy that is lasting for generations. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, Matt, is it hard to talk to your kids about sex? Yes. Is it awkward? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But can I tell you today, you know, it used to be the birds and bees conver conversation, which is stupid, but <laughs> educate yourself about this topic. There are tons of resources. And not to mention our, our young people are now bombarded with pornography to add to, uh, you know, a, a pile of things. So educate yourself as parents. Don't be in the dark. And don't allow somebody else to educate your kids on this. You're the one to hold the standard in your home. Don't, come on. Encourage yourself with that. <laughs> don't, don't wait for somebody else to have the conversation. Educate yourself. There's a lot of great resources and take the time to sit down with your kids. I guarantee after the first one or two times of having that conversation, it just comes naturally. And your kids will come ask you questions from that point forward that would make anybody else blush. But because you've already had the conversation, you just answer it. That's a good question. I'm glad you're asking me. And not your friend who doesn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number two. Hallelujah. All right, number two. Leading by example is one of the best ways to establish a positive atmosphere in your family. Leading by example is one of the best ways to establish a positive atmosphere in your family. God, have, you ever, have you ever walked in a home and just felt the chaos or the stress? or the weight, or maybe, maybe just the oppression in, in maybe that home. Now contrast that to someone else's home you've walked in and you felt love, accepted. Wow, I just feel peace. I just feel like I can let my hair down. Hair, one hair. <laughs> I can walk in, kick my, you know, kick my legs up and just relax. Like, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Well, that's called an atmosphere. It's, it's something that has been set in that home. 
And if you have a high strung individuals or high strung mom and dad, or there's a lot of uh, brokenness, or there's, I mean, it could be a number of things. All of those influence the atmosphere in the home. Now, we, we have six kids, um, and in the younger years, it was pretty, pretty wild sometimes. That's why we never invited anybody over. <laughs> I'm kidding. We had some people over, but <clears throat> it was people that knew us. And <laughs> well, yeah, one time. Um, and it took a year to get the house clean. But anyways, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so it was, it was pretty... You know, it was pretty chaotic in the sense, but for the most part, because we made it a priority to say God's first, there was an atmosphere, you know, we were playing worship music and uh, there was just, it was a a pretty peaceful atmosphere. But there was a season when one of my children, second born, strong willed, uh, decided to test anything and everything. Uh, in, in parenting, no book could prepare you for it. I mean, they give you some pointers how to handle it, but uh, boy, he put us through the ringer. And uh, there, it was chaos. Uh, I, you could the the tension you could be cut with a knife when he was, you know, at his level ten. And I was like, this is not healthy for our home. And there was a season we had to ask him to leave. And it was one of the hardest things that we could have done as a parent. But we had five other kids in the house that were being influenced by this negative, um, um, just rebellious attitude and mindset and just not willing to budge off of that. that, Say that good enough. Um, And so, I mean, it was a couple years of this. Uh, So we had to ask him to leave. Now, praise God that he had an encounter with Jesus, and it all turned around. So where where one season we thought he was going to be in jail or, you know, all kinds of messed up, and we've been, you know, praying the Lord deliver him out of that, Um, he's now on the other side of the law where he's actually in law enforcement. (laughs) So... Yay, he's not in jail. He's, a, he's throwing people in jail. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, but so there are, just recognize, God, we're not perfect, um, but we did, we, we honor God, we put him first, and in our home we try to create an atmosphere of peace um, and a, a place where our kids felt safe to have conversations and come to us because we want it to be that standard uh, bearer uh, for the moral compass and all the things that they would be faced with in life. So uh, here's, I love Proverbs 22, verse 6. And this is the Passion Translation. I love how this is worded. Dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. And the value they learn from you will be with them for life. The values you teach them, you instruct, you model. When they get old, they will remember those values and those. It's generationally, it's passed down. So where you think you're not making much of an impact, just know generationally it's making an impact. It's affecting how they raise their children. It's making a positive outcome. So it's not in vain. Solomon suggests that when a child is raised with the right values and perspective, those lessons will last a lifetime. The literal wording implies that a well-trained child will not stray from his path. A well-trained child will not stray from his path. That's why you teach the word. You teach it, you live it out, you're modeling it, and you're applying it throughout. Don't just bang them over the head with it, right? I, that's religion. But you're teaching it and you're making it applicable to their life. 
So in situations as the teens get older, or maybe even when they're smaller, and they're encountered with a consequence, you don't beat them over the head with the scripture, but you say, this is why the Lord tells us this in this scripture. And so to help us, we apply this scripture to our life. And, and you have those conversations with them, always leading them back to what does the word of God say? Um, while this proverb is not an ironclad guarantee and children may still choose different, a different way, a foundation of godliness provides them with something positive to return to when they reconsider their choices. They'll come back. The, the values you have instilled in them, the standards that you have placed in your family, they'll come back. So if they stray, pray. And when you finish praying, pray some more. Because God will get a hold of them and will bring them back to the standard that you have established in your family line. So how do we practically do this? Well, you got to... Uh, how do we practically establish a positive atmosphere in our families? One is engage in meaningful conversations. Talk about the Word of God. How do we apply the Word of God to our lives and to our into situations? So when mom and dad are dealing with something different, model a, a healthy version of how you walk through that. Um, be a model of integrity, kindness, and faithfulness. Live out the principles you want to instill in your children and show them what it means to love God and love others. This transparency and consistency can shape your children's understanding of what it means to follow Christ. So don't be afraid to have the conversations. Model it well. Do your research. You say, well, I, 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 don't, know. I don't know much about the word. Okay, well... Not everybody does starting out. So learn together. Study the word together. There, go to Mardell's. There's a whole section, two sections of discipleship curriculum, studies, Bible studies. For easy, it's got colored pictures and <laughs> maps. Helps you walk through it. One or two questions versus... Uh, 100 questions, you know, per study guide. But anyways, all right. Number three, commit to building a family atmosphere that is caring, patient, and uplifting. Ephesians 6, 4 says, and this is the living Bible. And now a word to you parents, to you parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children. Making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves with suggestions and godly advice. Don't scold. Don't nag. All that's going to do is make them mad and resentful. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my kids bitter or resentful towards me. I want them to come around when they start having grandkids. I, I don't want them to avoid our home because we've created a place where all, all y'all do is nag, 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 nag. So if you're a nagger, stop it. Amen. <laughs> Colossians 3.21. And fathers, this is the Passion Translations, don't have unrealistic expectations for your children or else they will become discouraged. A nurturing and encouraging home environment is crucial for the spiritual and emotional health of your family. To nurture means to care for and encourage growth, development, and well-being. So this is where identity, self-worth, value, and love begins in the home. So parents, how are you stewarding these essential elements in your household? Are you cultivating an, an environment where each family member feels valued, loved, and empowered to grow? So unrealistic expectations placed on children can lead to, un, actually, unrealistic expectations put on anybody can lead to an undue pressure, stress, and even feelings of inadequacy. 
And how many of you know we, we would never want our children to feel that, right? Yet many homes put unrealistic expectations on children. And let me share a few with you. Perfectionism. Expecting children to perform flawlessly in academic, sports, or other activities and not allowing room for mistakes or learning from failures. Adult-like behavior. Don't expect a two-year-old, especially a young man, two-year-old, <laughs> to act like a 25, 30-year-old young man. It's not going to happen. Expecting children to behave with the maturity and self-control of adults, overlooking their de developmental stage and need for guidance, we can't do that. So just know that there's going to be some phases in life. They're going to be a little more rambunctious. Boys are going to want to jump all over things. They're going to want to climb trees. Now, now you guide them through and make sure that they're safe, right? Let boys be boys and experience nature and have fun. Don't shut them down every time they get a little bit of wild on them. Okay? Amen? Amen. All right. Spoken like a real father of six kids. <laughs> oh, six boys. All right. Uh, here's another one. Immediate compliance. Demanding immediate obedience without understanding or discussing the child's feelings or perspectives, which can disregard their individuality and autonomy. So the Bible tells us, rather bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves with suggestions and godly advice. We're going back to what does the word of God say? So we're helping structure the moral compass, the, the right and wrong in each of our children. But if, if we demand compliance every time, we're not helping them understand right from wrong we're telling them that you better submit or else and that is not loving that creates tension and it's and it can be very controlling and as your kids get older that's what it's going to come out as is you're controlling and i don't know about you but as a parent i don't want to control my children but I want to teach them and I want to help build that moral compass in them where they understand right from wrong and they're able to recognize the consequences of their action. And then they, they begin to choose because there's a healthy atmosphere in the home. They begin to choose to honor mom and dad and they're quick to obey when they're asked to do something. And I don't have to, asked them a hundred times because I've sat down and I've taken the time to explain to them or understand maybe why they're not getting it. Hey, daddy's had to ask you to do this a lot of times. How come I have to ask you so many times to do that? How can I help you in the future so I don't have to whoop you? How can I help you be obedient the first time I ask you to do something? You see the difference? All right. Um, comparison to others is another one. Comparing children to siblings uh, or peers or, other, or, or even the parents' younger selves it can foster feelings of inadequacy or competition. So don't, don't do that to your, your children. God has uniquely created each one of them. And they all have a different bent. That's why we had six, because we wanted to see how many bins you could have in children. <laughs> you can have six, for sure. <laughs> they don't all come out the same way. No, they come out the same way. They don't all come out the same personalities. <laughs> this is safe. All right. We can talk about this in church. Hallelujah. All right. So don't, don't pit your kids against each other. Don't, don't do that to them. Love each of them the same way, uniquely, and then celebrate their gifts and their talents. God has given each of them a gift and a talent. Find out what it is and celebrate it. Encourage it. 
love on them and support them. The legacy you create starts with the love and affirmation you pour into your home today. So challenge yourself to be stewards of a nurturing and faith-filled family. Uh, I love what Mother Teresa said. Uh, what can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. Because ultimately, love begins at home. And it affects, its effects ripple outward to the broader community and beyond. Love your kids well at home. And they will do that well out in, out in the community, out in culture. All right, last one, number four. By, dis, by demonstrating the strengths of a healthy marriage, you create a positive example that your kids will be grateful for. I cannot tell you how important this is. A healthy marriage is so, from stats, uh, from a statistical, well, that's a hard word, Statistical standpoint, it's important to have a healthy marriage. Your family needs to see that. Your kids need to see that. Um, and it needs to be modeled in the home for several reasons. Because it can have a lasting impact on the well-being and development of children and the overall family dynamic. Some of you have come from broken homes. You've come from homes that, um, that did not have a healthy marriage modeled. There was a lot of tension in the home. And for that, I'm, I'm sorry that that's what, was, what, was, uh, what your upbringing was. Um, but I believe that you have an opportunity to change that for your family and to do something different than what was modeled to you. So um, some ways that we can do that is to, in, is to create emotional stability and security. So a healthy marriage creates that emotional and stability and security. Children who grow up in a home with a healthy marriage often feel more secure and safe, and they trust that their parents will be there for them and each other. A stable and loving relationship between parents can reduce anxiety and emotional stress in children, fostering a more peaceful and predictable home environment. Um, a healthy marriage is basically role modeling healthy relationships. Children learn by observing their parents. One of the things that my kids texted me was that, uh, that we modeled a, he a healthy marriage in the home. And we did. We, we were intentional. Y'all, I'm at six kids. It's hard to be intentional in your marriage. But we, we lived that out. We did it. Uh, there were times that it was so chaos or busy, and I was working four jobs at one time. It was just hard to navigate that, but we were intentional to make sure that we poured into our marriage because we knew that that was foundational to building a healthy, strong environment for our kiddos. So by seeing a healthy marriage, children are more likely to seek and maintain healthy relationships in their own lives. So understanding what to expect and what to give in partnership. They see the, the dynamics of it's, you know, we're not just 25% and 75%, but we're each giving 100% in the relationship. And the dynamics are now not just put on one individual. Remember back in the days, it used to be like the woman did all of this in the home, and the man did all this in the home. Uh, one of the things that was modeled to me growing up is that, and especially in, with my stepdad, is he, he did, uh, he was washing clothes, washing dishes. He helped out around the house, but also did what we would call dad duties, you know, outside mowing the lawn. So it's a partnership. It, the, your, your helpmates to one another. And so you model that uh, in your family and your kids see that and they're like, oh yeah, that's what I want. I want healthy. And they may go over to a friend's house and they see unhealthy and they're like, oh Lord, I don't want that. <laughs> um, let's see, conflict resolution is modeled uh, when you have a healthy relationship. Witnessing parents handle disagreements in a healthy manner teaches children that conflicts are a natural part of relationships and can be resolved constructively, okay? So they don't need to see things being flung across the room. 
They don't need to see your mom throwing dad over the couch. <laughs> but really, it's, they need to see how you handle conflict. Y'all, they're going to they're gonna get out in the world, and there's going to be conflict left and right. And so if we model that in the home, how to, how to navigate conflict healthily, is that a word? Uh, then, then they will be able to handle work situations, school situations when there's conflict with another person. And so we want to make sure that we model that well. Um, and it also, um, children learn what dysfunctional relationships look like and are more likely to avoid such patterns in their own life when there's dysfunction going on. So we want to make sure that we're modeling, help, dealing with healthy conflict and, and not being dysfunctional. So, um, and if you are already there, you're like, Matt, we're already at dysfunction. <laughs> Get some help. Yeah. Get some help. Don't, don't continue down that pattern. Recognize when there's dysfunction. Everybody knows what dysfunction looks like, right? Yeah. Can you recognize it in your own life and in your own family? So change it. Don't keep going down. Well, we've, it's always been like that. We're just going to, don't. Change it so that your kids have a fighting chance. So there's just a few examples. Uh, those are just a few examples, but you can see that modeling a healthy marriage in the home is crucial for fostering a supportive, stable, and nurturing environment. I, I liken it to uh, a garden. When you tend to the garden, it flourishes. So when you tend the garden with love and patience and care, your marriage will flourish. And if there's one word that I can leave with you, husbands and wife, it's this, be intentional. Make space to pour into your marriage. Grow and mature in your relationship, in your faith together. Your kids need to see that. So when there's a marriage conference that comes up, be the first ones to sign up. And don't just do it for yourself, but do it because your kids need to see a healthy mom and dad. And you're doing it for yourself because the reality is your kids are going to what? Move out. And you're going to be left with each other. And those who have poured into their marriage and have invested and have been intentional are going to be making out every night. <laughs> and those <laughs> who have failed to tend the garden it's going to be so crowded with weeds and you're going to be like in one of those places where I've seen many couples throw in the towel because it's, they, don't, they don't feel like there's any hope for them. And so they end up divorcing after they've spent 20, 30 years of investing in their children but not investing in their marriage. Y'all, you, there's balance. Yes, you invest in your children and you love on them, but not at the expense of your marriage. You invest in both. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this word. I pray that, Lord, this was encouraging to those and that needed to hear a fresh word on family and what it looks like to lead by example. God, those that may be feeling conviction this morning, I ask Holy Spirit, you help them to navigate that, to work through the details. And if there's some things that need to change in their home, uh, if there's things that need to change in their marriage, if there's things that need to change in their parenting style, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're the greatest teacher and that you would help them navigate that well. If they need to get some, some uh, books that help them be better in those areas or they need to connect with uh, other individuals, Lord, that help hold them accountable in those areas. Whatever it may be, Holy Spirit, instruct them. I pray that nobody in here would feel shame or guilt for any of the decisions that have been made over their life, but they would only point to Jesus to say thank you, that you are a God who redeems, and you bring us up 
out of our filth, out of our destructive ways, and you set us back on track to realign with you. And so I pray that as people leave today, they know your love. They sense your presence. I bless marriages today, Lord God. Those that are struggling, Father, I just pray for them right now. And I pray that you'd bring unity. That you'd bring healing. Maybe there's some past hurts, and the Lord says, I want to heal those past hurts right now in your marriage. Maybe some things that were said that didn't need to be said. I just see that the Lord's scrubbing those things off today. There's a fresh start coming to those who have had some struggles in their marriage. And I believe if you'll be intentional from this point forward to pour into your marriage and to do it right, God will honor the obedience. Lord, I pray for our young people. God, that they would be uh, in this room. God, they would be a standard bearer of of purity and holiness and righteousness for the upcoming generation. God, that their moral compass to choose from right and wrong God would be balanced and they would understand and they would actually be able to uh, teach even their friends how to stand for truth and how to make better choices and decisions when it comes to relationships and and even honoring their their bodies. I pray that their identity and their self-worth and their value, God, wouldn't be found in people found in you, Jesus. And those young people that are struggling with their identity, their self-worth, Jesus right now, I pray that you would bring encouragement to them. Solidify in them that you see value in them. That you know them and love them beyond uh, greater than anybody else could ever love them value them. I bless our people today and I bless our fathers today. Father, we thank you for this time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his countenance towards you and show you peace. Have a blessed day. Thank you for listening today. Our hope is that this message is an encouragement to you to change your world. Before you go, we want to connect with you. If you have a prayer request, you're interested in what we have to offer for our students, or you want to learn more about us, visit us at our website at lifehousefellowship.net. Remember, great days are here and greater days are ahead.